June. Now we'll be down in the hall on the 4th of June, but we'll still be having the vote at the close of service for the purpose of receiving the basis of union for our growth and conducting a vote. All members of the congregational role and those who have been officially recognised by the Kirk session as adherents are entitled to vote, providing they are present at the meeting. So it's important that everyone turns up on the 4th of June to vote for this important decision that we're making within the churches here in our growth on the basis of union. I think these are all the intimations. We've come together today to praise God. So let's remain seated as we sing, we're here to praise you and praise the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. As we sing together, we are here to praise you.
Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. We are here to praise you, lift our hearts and sing. We are here to give you the best that we can bring. And it is our love rising from our hearts. Everything within us cries, Abba, Father. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we come to you as our Heavenly Father, as part of your family, and acknowledge that there is none like you. We thank you for each person gathered here this morning. We thank you for your promise to be with us when we come together in your name. And so help us to be still and to wait upon you and be open to listening to what your Holy Spirit may say to us. We're sorry in the busy life that we live, we often have no time to do things that we should do. We leave things undone. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge that we don't have the time to spend with you as we should. We don't have time to listen to that still small voice leading us day by day. There are things that we've said that perhaps we shouldn't have said. There are actions that we've taken that have not been pleasing to you, that may have upset someone. And so help us to be reconciled and reach out in love, remembering that we are called to love because you first loved us. And so help us to remember that it's as we confess our sins to you, you will forgive and give us the strength we need to be those who reflect the beauty of Jesus in all we do and say. We thank you that you want to lift us up into your presence, into your arms of love. That you are the good shepherd who's called each one of us by name and invite us to come and follow you. And so we thank you for the care and the love that you've shown to all of us. We thank you for the way that your Savior, uh, your Son, our Savior, who invited us into a personal relationship with you. And so this morning, help us to appreciate you in a new and fresh way as we worship together, as we sing our praise, as we listen to your word. And so let the beauty of Jesus be seen in us. Father, we thank you for the beauty of your creation all around us. Things that we can look to and remember that you are a wonderful God, a creator God. And so help us, God, to know that you and your love is right here for us. You want us to move deeper into you and worship you today. And so we come before you, offering our prayers in Jesus' name. And so let's say together the words of the Lord's Prayer as he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> Right, I want what I brought with me today. It's interesting to see some of the things that have been left on the communion table, but I brought something special today. I like learning new things. What are some of the things you've had to learn? You tell me some of the things you've had to learn. In school you have to learn maths, right? So school's a learning opportunity for you, yes? What about some of the things you maybe learned at home? Sorry? You learned cooking at home. Are you a good cook? Oh, right, so we'll need to come round to your place for something to eat then if we want a good cook. You learned how to walk when you were little, yes? So you've gone through the stages of trolling and then walking, yes? Oh, you learned French. Good. You're learning Spanish. All right. Is that so if you go on holiday, you can speak the language? All right. 
What are some of the other things you've had to learn? What about learn how to tidy? Oh, maybe I need to learn how to tidy as well. What else? Learn Magneton, that's great. I know when I've been into school, it's great that from primary one right through, they're learning Magneton. But what are some of the other things? You, did you have to learn to tie shoelaces? Yes. Did you have to learn to eat different types of food? Did you have to learn to go a bike? You fell off your bike. Oh, you bumped into a wall. Oh, right. So you had a nasty scratch and cut because you fell off your bike. Right. You've slipped off a wall and fallen on your face. Right. Well, maybe you shouldn't have been on the wall in the first place. Anyway, what are some of the other things we've got to learn? Maybe I can get help from some of the other people in the congregation this morning. Sorry? You had to learn how to sing. Good. Right. Learn to drive. Okay. Learn how to spell. So there's all sorts of things through life. Learn how to read, yes. Okay. So uh, lifelong learning, isn't it? We're never too old to learn new things. Right. So when you see a, an L like that, where would you normally see it? You would see it on a car because, because someone's learning how to drive a car. Now, what else have they got to learn? Yes, that's a highway code. But do you think that's going to teach me how to do things today? Or have things changed? Yes. Oh, 1954. We were before my time, <laughs> when I was learning to drive. Because when I learned to drive in our roof, there were no roundabouts, one set of traffic lights, up at the end of Lockwood Street, when it comes up from Kempty. I think that was about all we had to learn and worry about, and do a hill start on the end of Street Bray. So that came in in 1954. So it meant it was upgraded, didn't it? And here's one. Oh, 1959. Do you think that's going to be relevant today? I wonder how many of your drivers have got one of these. The new highway code. And as I was going through this the other day, these highway codes show hand signals. I didn't realize that a new hand highway code still has hand signals in it. But again, it's a guidebook to instruct us on all the rules of the road. It doesn't matter if you're walking on the road, if you're cycling on the road, if you're on a motorbike, if you're in a car, if you're in a lorry, all the rules of the road are contained in here. And also, there are all sorts of signs, aren't there? to signpost us and make sure that we get things right and do things the proper way. So, we agree that there must be a big change from these thin highway codes to this highway code with all the new rules and regulations. But there are some things that never change. In the Old Testament, for instance, God says, I am the Lord, I change not and so we've got to make sure that we read his guidebook 
Who gave the wisdom and gave us? The Bible, that's right. And it says we read the Bible, the road that God has got for us. So we want to make sure that when you come to Fun Club, you'll learn more about God through what it says in the Bible. So, we're all learners, aren't we? Because you're never too old to learn. And if you don't understand things, ask. And sometimes we're too shy to ask, aren't we? <coughs> right. But when you play games, there are rules and regulations you have to follow as well. All through life, we've got to learn. But the most important lesson we can learn is to love Jesus. Okay. So we're all learners. We're learning together. So let's now sing a hymn that reminds us at the end of the fourth verse, I think it is, that we are a learner of Jesus. Come let us sing of a wonderful love, tender and true. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, 
So, your sins are forgiven. <coughs> now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this folk fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins in their hearts? And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? To, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, <coughs> took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. <coughs> this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen. <coughs> Thank you very much, Fraser, for reading God's Word to us this morning. <coughs> Let's sing together again, Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee.
new every morning. Thy mercies I see. And so we come before you and we thank you that you're here with us. Help us to be still and to wait upon you as we look together at your word. May the Holy Spirit challenge us to make sure that we are at home with Jesus in our own lives. And so help us now as we look at your word together in Jesus' name. Amen. At home with Jesus. The Gospel of Mark is brief and to the point. It's one of the shortest Gospels. But then again, it starts with Jesus' baptism just at the beginning of his ministry. And the first chapter begins with John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and baptizing Jesus in the River Jordan. In chapter 1 and verse 10, as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus then went on to spend 40 days in the desert, being tempted by Satan before the start of his ministry, when he proclaimed, The time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. And then in the next few verses it tells us how Jesus met up with the men who became his disciples, how he healed the man who he met in the synagogue. And how the people round about him were amazed, as shown in the following verses. Verse 21 and 22 of chapter 1. Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught with authority, not as the teachers of the law. And then in verse 27, again, the people were amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority and we know that jesus of course taught with authority because he had authority that had come from god and of course he had authority because he knew that he was what he was talking about and of course jesus had authority because he believed what he taught and then mark quickly leads us into the house of simon and andrew perhaps thinking that jesus and his disciples were going to their home to give him a break from the crowds. However, on arrival, they find Simon's mother-in-law ill with a fever, and Jesus quite simply healed her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. And later that evening, people brought their sick for Jesus to heal. So Jesus had been very busy. And yet, he rose early the next morning, he found a solitary place to spend time with God in prayer. And so that begs the question, how much time do we spend alone with God in prayer? But he didn't get much time to be alone with his heavenly Father in prayer because, again, in verse 37, the disciples tell Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Are we that enthusiastic that we go looking for Jesus? But Jesus told him he needed to go somewhere else. He needed to go to the other villages so that he could preach there as well. And so Jesus moved through Galilee preaching and healing. And so just in the first chapter, we have already learned a lot about what Jesus has been up to. And Mark tells us from one event to the next, Jesus was moving on. And so he moved into chapter 2 as we read this morning. Though we find that he was returning to Capernaum, back home. He was probably returning to the home of Simon and Andrew. But news spread so fast that Jesus had come back home and was at the home of Simon and Andrew. That it wasn't long before the crowds had arrived. It wasn't long before there was no room inside or outside the house. But Jesus preached to those who had gathered. He was always willing regardless of circumstances, to preach the good news of the gospel. And so the people were tightly packed in, inside and out, all trying to hear what Jesus had to say, not wanting to miss a word or any action that Jesus might have performed. 
How wonderful it would be, wouldn't it, if we came to church one Sunday morning and couldn't get in because the place was absolutely packed. People wanting to hear about Jesus. But however, while most of the people were making their way to the house to hear Jesus, there were four friends making their way to their friend's house. They wanted the friend to meet Jesus, but they knew that they would need help. They saw the need, and they went to help. And surely this is what church is all about, isn't it? Seeing the need and reaching out to help. We've been reaching out to help. In the past week, over Christian Aid Week, we've looked at helping others through the donations we bring for the food bank and many other ways that we look out, see a need, and are willing to help. Extending the family into the community. And these friends could just as easily have rushed around where they were to see Jesus, where they were staying. They could have just as easily wanted to do their own thing. Instead, they went for their friend. And however, when they arrived, they realized there was no way they were going to get into the house. There was no way they were going to get anywhere near Jesus because there was no room at all for them. There was no room to fit in four men and another man on a stretcher. And so we know the expression, don't we? Desperate times call for desperate measures. This was probably what the friends were thinking. They wanted their friend who was paralyzed to be healed. There was an urgency, there was a desperation, and they believed that Jesus could heal them. In verse 4, so they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat, and the paralyzed man was laying on. Jesus didn't complain that all the dust and mud and straw that would be falling down around him. He was in full flow, but he had time to spend for this paralyzed man. And when Jesus saw the faith of these four friends, he said to the paralytic, the paralytic, Son, son, your sins are forgiven. And it was because of the four men's determined action to bring their friend to Jesus, their faith could be seen. Faith in action. What a wonderful testimony. Each one of us has got a testimony, and we've got to make sure that people see our faith in action action. And what a wonderful term of endearment to the man who was healed. Jesus called the paralyzed man son. Jesus knows each one of us. He's calling each one of us by name. How are we going to respond? We all need healed from our sins. And Jesus was the man's greatest need. He saw exactly what the man's need was. It didn't mean that the man's palace was caused by his sin. But Jesus addressed his greatest need, his forgiveness of sin. And forgiveness is one of the greatest miracles because it meets man's greatest need and it costs the greatest price. Because Jesus carried our sins to death on the cross. He conquered death by his resurrection. And so, Jesus healed this paralyzed man. But there were those in that congregation that were listening to Jesus that were up in arms at what Jesus was saying. It didn't conform to their thinking. It didn't conform to the teaching of the Old Testament because the Old Testament law would often associate illness with sin. In the five books of the Pentateuch with the law of Moses. That's what these Pharisees and the leaders of the law and the leaders of the church there were thinking. And they believed that only God could forgive sin. And they refused to recognize who Jesus was. They refused, they refused to recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. He had the authority as God's Son to forgive sins. But just as Jesus could see the faith of these four friends, so you could see what the teachers of the law were thinking. What they were thinking to themselves. Immediately in verse 8, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Jesus asked them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, 
Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. It was easy to see that the man had been healed. So they could see with their own eyes that he was walking. But it wouldn't be possible to see the forgiveness of this, his sin because it's invisible. But it's quite amazing, isn't it? That the teachers of the law refused to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Not only had they seen Jesus healing many people, not only had they seen Jesus preaching God's work, but they also must have realized that Jesus had been able to see what they were thinking. How does that make you feel? To know that Jesus knows your thoughts. And even before a word's on your tongue, he knows exactly what you're going to be saying. But anyway, everyone else in that house was amazed. They were praising God. We have never seen anything like this. And so we come to church full of praise, full of adoration, because of what Jesus has done for us. Because it brings us into a right relationship. And when we come face to face with Jesus, we should be expecting the unexpected. The faith of these four friends brought the man to Jesus. They lured him through the roof. But Simon and Andrew had invited Jesus to their home. The miracle took place in full view of the crowds of people. How do you think Simon and Andrew were feeling? I'm sure they would feel that the brothers were very happy to invite Jesus to their home. And so that begs the question, what about you? Have you invited Jesus into your life? Have you invited Jesus into your home? The hymn said, have you any room for Jesus? And that's the thought that we've got this morning. Have you invited Jesus into your home? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we give you thanks that you are indeed the miracle working God. You're the same yesterday, today and forever. We thank you that you have given us your word which reminds us, which instructs us that we have to be in a right relationship with you. Father, as we come before you this morning, we give you thanks for Christian aid. We thank you for the opportunity we have to make a physical donation to help the organization in the many areas where it works to bring relief to those who are impoverished. Father, we pray that you will take the money that we've brought before you, that you will use it for the extension and the upbuilding of your kingdom. We think of our denomination and the fact that we've got the General Assembly down in Edinburgh in these coming days. We pray for the new moderator, for Sally Foster Fuston. We thank you for the way that she has led the organization of Christian Aid in Scotland, but we thank you now that she has now got the responsibility for leading the church forward through these difficult, changing times. Grant her wisdom and all those around her. Help them always to look to you and to know your will and how we move forward as one. Father, we think of our world. We think areas that are suffering from national disasters, flooding, hurricanes. We think of those that are torn apart because of war in our world. Father, we come before you now and we think of the politicians who've met together to try and bring peace. And you've told us that blessed are the peacemakers. We think of those who, because of all these disasters and wars, have lost their home, have lost everything. Be with them in the camps or if they've come to seek asylum, Father, be with them and help them to know that you love them through these difficult days. And Father, we think of our own country. We think of the politicians and the many important decisions that they have to make. Decisions that affect all of us at national and local level. Grant them wisdom and help them to realize that they are responsible to a higher authority. 
Father, as we come before you, we thank you that you have promised to be with us when we gather together in your name. We thank you for our church family, for those who have gathered here this morning, for those who are unable to gather, who may be in hospital, who may be awaiting results of tests, who may be anxious and worried. Father, draw especially close to them. May they know your peace and love surrounding them. Lift them up in your arms of love. Call them by name and remind them that they're special. And so, Heavenly Father, we come before you now, giving you thanks that you are a God who loves us. May we all experience your love in a new and fresh way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's sing together again. Through the love of God our Saviour, all will be well. Amen. May the Lord, mighty God, 